Like, Lord, my belief is dwindling right now. Help me. Lord, how can I trust you when it feels like my bank account is dwindling? Lord, why does it feel like you're answering all my prayers about ministry, but when it comes to my personal desires, you're quiet? Is your passion for God conditional upon the promises you think that he's going to give to you? And we wonder why we're getting disappointed so frequently. Because we're putting, we're putting an expectation on God that God never co-signed. We're putting, we're putting a, an expectation on God where he's like, I didn't even have that in the plans for you. Even though I'm not satisfied. Will I still believe that God is a provider? Will I still believe that God is a healer? Will I still believe that God is good? Will I still believe that God is loving? What does it mean to not be satisfied and to still have the same heart that to pursue after God unconditionally? What's good, family? Welcome to the Abide and Seek podcast, where we share the authentic and unfiltered Christian perspective to build in faith, purpose, and spiritual maturity. If you're new here, I'm Taylor. And if you're a part of the family, then welcome back. So for today, um, we're just going to be talking. We're just going to keep it real. Can we keep it real? Um, we're just going to be talking about when you feel disappointed, when you feel dissatisfied in your walk with God, when you feel like you had a burning fire, a burning zeal when walking with God at first and it's starting to dwindle. It's, it's that side of your Christian walk when you're like, why am I, am I doing this for nothing? Am I doing this? Like, like, am I really being real in this walk? You know, it's like, I remember where I used to be, but where I'm at right now, I don't even feel like I have half the faith of how I did back then when I first started. Um, So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, And just keeping it real with that. Uh, Before I jump into this topic, I just want to make a quick shout out, um, honestly, uh, with this book. I'm not, I'm not promoting, I'm not getting paid for this. I'm not, I promise. (laughs) But this book right here, When Faith Disappoints by Lisa Fields. My goodness, my goodness. And I, I had the um, the opportunity to go to Courageous Conversations this year. Um, and that this was that was the theme um, of uh, the conference as well. So with this book, I'm not going to go into it, I'm not going to ruin it because I'm telling you that book will, will help transform your faith for real. Um, I'll be very honest when I was talking uh, with Lisa about this book, like, um, when I was there at the conference, I was telling her, I was like, I'll be very honest. If anything, I have a confession to make <laughs> when she released the title of this book. Like I was like, oh, I can't wait to put this book in such and such hands. I can't wait until so-and-so reads this book because then their eyes will finally be open to the faith. Little did I know that this book was the wake up call that I needed for my own faith, because there are moments in our walk, just like what I mentioned, when you feel disappointed. When you feel upset, when you have more questions than answers, when you feel frustrated, when you're in that wrestle with God, like what I talked about um, in the last podcast, it's moments when you're just like, Lord, why? (laughs) God, what's up? Why does it feel quiet? Why does it feel like everyone else's prayers are being answered but mine? Why does it feel like I'm left in the dark? Why does it feel like every single lesson is hard? Why does it feel like, like, I'm being beat up with convictions right now (laughs) and everybody else is living the life that I desire to live. Like it feels like I'm always in a a hard season after a hard season after a hard season when it feels like everybody else is just living in la-la land. And when having these feelings, it's like with with this book, honestly, and this this is a staple. This is going to be a staple for me, honestly, um, because I really enjoy reading. That was something that I picked up this year. Uh, just more leisure reading. And with these resources that are out, y'all, it's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. So I wanted to at least just, you know, just give a quick shout out to her because this book here, like she really put, um, she really put into words some things that it was hard for us to even admit. She put into prayers even to God, you know, prayers to God, like, like, Lord, my belief is dwindling right now. Help me. Lord, how can I trust you when it feels like my bank account is dwindling? Lord, why does it feel like you're answering all my prayers about ministry, but when it comes to my personal desires, you're quiet? So she brings all these questions to the forefront. Literally everything 
you know, or different things that pop up in our faith, in our hearts, the things that we may even be afraid to ask God. She puts that on paper. So I just wanted to give a quick shout out for that because I'm telling y'all this book, it, it's, it changed my walk for sure in the best ways. Um, because literally like, and she puts a prayer at the end, um, of every chapter and I, almost every single one was one that I needed. Um, I'm actually going to read one, still get the book, get the book for real. I'm going to read one, but this was one where I, I just, I was just like, man, this, this right here, <laughs> it's going to be a little long, but whatever. We're just going to go ahead and read it. Um, cause I feel like it's a good one. And I feel like someone, someone needs to hear this prayer today. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and read it. God, I realize that I've placed my identity in things that were too small. When I look in the mirror, I'm often unhappy with who I see. Some days I don't even want to be alive. The taunts from those who have hurt me ring in my ears. If I'm honest, I've come to believe what they say about me more than what you say about me. Their words are ever present, and I say negative things about myself to myself, too. I'm trying not to hate myself, but I find it difficult sometimes. God, help me see myself the way you see me. Please help me to see my value. Show me how much I am loved and treasured by you. Please help me remember when I'm feeling less than that I am made in your image. God, when I am tempted to put my identity in things that are too small, Remind me that being made in your image is more than enough. I need your help. I can't do it on my own. In Jesus' name, amen. So, but that's just, so that's just a sample. That's just a sample. But I'm, this book, go and get it. Just go and get it. Just go and get it. Why are you waiting? Just get it. Um, but anyway, but this, this, this podcast episode, it, I, um, Receive these three words, at least, you know, just from God, just from praying over these last couple of weeks, uh, even before I even read this book. Right. Um, but it was it was three words. And God was saying, be aware of the dangers of unbelief, disappointment and stagnation. Be aware of the dangers of them. And I, I was like, OK, the dangers of unbelief, disappointment and stagnation. So this was a couple weeks ago, right? When God was putting this on my heart and I was going to record this episode last week, but then I was praying. I was like, Lord, I know I'm about to go to this conference, right? Should I go ahead and just wait until afterwards just to see if there's any other new revelations that you want to give me? Um, and he allowed me to wait, you know, uh, to go ahead and experience the conference, things like that. And even after finishing this book and um, it just put a lot more, uh, I put a lot more uh, language to some of the emotions and to some of the words that in the revelations that I was having. So I'm glad that I was able to wait and put all of those things together um, so that I can go ahead and record this episode for y'all today. So hopefully this um, provides some encouragement. It provides some language to where you may be sitting because it's one of those things where it's like, you know, when you, you know, when you're cool with somebody, but you're like, something feels off. Like something feels like this is not where it should be. Like I, it's like you remember that there's good and healthy times, but you're not exactly in an unhealthy or toxic place, but it's like a weird neutral kind of in the middle. Like you're just kind of tolerating each other. And I'm kind of, I'm not kind of, I am speaking to that kind of in between stage. When you're in, in that in between stage where you're just kind of like tolerating each other, that's where different doors can open of unbelief, of stagnation, of uh, disappointment. And the reason why we're, we're in that middle stage sometimes when you're not, not too good, not too bad, we're in that in between. But in that in between, it's because you're not satisfied. Let's call a spade a spade. It means you're not satisfied. And that's, that was the root of it. So that's what God was telling me was like, um, uh, unbelief, disappointment and stagnation is all rooted in dissatisfaction. It's all rooted in dissatisfaction, you know? So, um, and this is what it means to be satisfied, to be satisfied means that you're meeting the expectations, the needs or the desires of someone or something right? That's what it means to be satisfied. But the fact that when you're in that in-between stage, 
when you're like, yeah, God, we cool, but I mean, it ain't as on fire as it used to be. You know, it ain't bad though, but I'm just kind of in that middle ground. We're unsatisfied or dissatisfied. We're not, we're not to the point where we are truly on fire like where we used to be. So we're just going to be talking about that a little bit more. And something else that I had in my notes is unexpressed expectations are premeditated disappointments. Mm. Unexpressed expectations are premeditated disappointments. So if I'm, if I have these unreleased expectations, right, that I'm praying to God, where it's like, oh, well, God knows the desires of my heart anyway. Or, or if we have a timeline, or if we have a fantasy in our mind, or like, and it, we're going to be getting into this too. But because we have these unreleased expectations, because we're not being completely honest in our prayer life, because we're not being completely honest to God, because we're not bringing God our frustrations, we're not bringing God like um, just the areas where we feel disappointed in life. Because we're not bringing that to God, we have these unhidden expectations, right? Like, oh, yeah, God, I'll trust you until I turn a certain age. And then now, now I'd be like, OK, where's my where's my package? Right. I thought you said that the package was in, was in transit and it still ain't delivered. Where's this answer prayer at? Did it get lost? <laughs> did, it, did my package get lost? Because it feels like everybody else's package are, packages of answered prayers are getting delivered except for mine. But we need to express these expectations to God, not saying that he's going to meet those expectations because he's not meant to bend to you. Right. He's not meant to be like, OK, if I'm meant to I want to have this goal, this goal, this goal, this goal by this age. That's my expectation. We can present these things to God. And if that's what he allows and that's what he allows. But because we have this this preconceived fantasy. In our mind, this this timeline that we made up, this timeline that we thought was the best for our lives in our mind, that's the expectation. And the moment that the, the moment that we reach that that age in life or that goal in life and things don't, and we look around and things don't look the way that we think. Now, next thing you know, we're disappointed. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Now, um, something I do want to remind you all of, of course, something that's in the Beatitudes that people may be familiar with, right? But this one sticks out to me just so much. Um, Matthew 5, 6, and I'm going to read it in the Amplified version. That's actually what I'm going to be reading all today with the scriptures that I have for y'all. It's going to be coming out of the Amplified version. So Matthew 5, 6, blessed, joyful, nourished by God's goodness are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who actively seek right standing with God for they will be completely satisfied. Okay. That's Matthew 5, 6. I know some to simplify it in a sense, like in other translations, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. Okay. But that's what they, I wanted to read the amplified version um, because it, 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 it applies um, more context to the scripture, um, especially with saying those who actively seek right standing with God, they will be completely satisfied. And that's what I want to uh, point out today. So when preparing for this podcast, God led me to Isaiah 55. Um, and we'll just be reading verses one through three. And I'm going to read that out of, again, the Amplified version. Um, but something in this version, uh, well, not in this version, but the title of it, and it may vary from translation to translation, but the title of it is Invitation to the Thirsty. Invitation to the Thirsty. Or for some, you know, it, it's, you know, it, anyway, I'm not even going to go into that. But it's just <laughs> invitation to the thirsty. And that one stuck out with me, stuck out to me because it's like we're thirsty for something. Everybody's thirsty for something. Everybody yearns for something. Like, you know, when you are when you're working out or you go for a walk and you're like, I need something to drink. I need something. We're yearning for something. We're thirsty for something. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, read this verse and then I'm going to go into my notes um, from these verses. So this is Isaiah 55 verses one through three. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and you who have no money, come buy grain and eat, come buy wine and milk 
without money and without cost, simply accept it as a gift from God. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your earnings for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight in abundance. Incline your ear to listen and to come to me here so that your soul may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies promised and shown to David. And I, I wanted to read these verses, but one of the main parts that a couple of the main things that stuck out to me, especially the, the fact when I read it and it said, and you who have no money, come and buy grain and eat, come and buy wine and milk. I'm like, but you just said we ain't got no money. Right. But when I looked in some commentaries, it says, which you shall freely partake of and enjoy as your own, as if you had bought and paid full price for it. So it's a gift that's freely given. Right. But you get to enjoy it as your own. You get to enjoy it as if you bought and paid full price. So apparently he's being funny here. Right. You ain't got no money except this gift. (laughs) You ain't got no money. Accept this gift. And when you accept this gift, then you can you can enjoy the full fulfillment of this gift as if you paid for it, as if you bought it, as if you uh, paid the full price for it. You can enjoy this gift freely. So that's the first part um, that I, I saw in there. And I was like, what? But it's a gift. It's a gift. So he's saying you ain't got no money. You ain't got nothing. You ain't got nothing that you can offer me. There is nothing. (laughs) There is nothing that we can give to God. Right. I mean, we'll give to God in a sense of there's nothing that God's willing to give these things freely. Right. We can't pay for peace. We can't pay for his mercies. We can't pay for his grace. We can't pay for his love. God cannot be bought. God can't be bought. He's like, so you ain't got no money. He's like, come and buy this grain and eat. But you don't buy it with the things that you think you need to purchase with it, right? Instead, he's like, give me your humility, right? Give surrender to me. Be open to, and be ready to receive this gift that I'm giving you. That's what you can purchase it get with, right? So it's not really in a sense of buying it with monetary things. Buying it with things that we think God wants to have. Because just like what it says in Psalms, where it says um, God does not turn away a sacrifice of a broken heart, a, a, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. He doesn't turn that away, but that's what we can give to him. And in return, that's when he'll be able to satisfy us with that water, with that living water. So the other part that I wanted to point out in here, why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your earnings for what does not satisfy? We're over here thirsting for the wrong things. We're spending money on things that, are temp- that, that bring temporary relief. Alcohol, weed, drugs. We're spending mu- food even. I mean, food's necessary, but sometimes we overeat. Sometimes we eat our feelings. I'll be honest. I used to keep like a tub of ice cream (laughs) in the freezer. That was my guilty pleasure, right? That was my guilty pleasure. I used to eat it even though I'm lactose intolerant. Mm. But anyway, so, but I used to keep a tub of, of some good old gelato in the freezer. And that used to be a staple whenever I went grocery shopping. Because it would bring some temporary satisfaction. It would bring temporary relief from my day, but I realized it wasn't good for me because when I wake up the next day or even a few few hours later, I realized I'm not supposed to be eating that gelato, okay? <laughs> I am not supposed to be eating that ice cream. But anyway, um, but it temporarily satisfies. Honestly, I mean, it's gross, but that's a, a good explanation where it's something that temporarily satisfies, but later you're hurting, later you're in pain, Later, you're regretting (laughs) eating that ice cream. It could be anything else. Later, you're regretting going over that person's house. Later, you're regretting getting drunk. Later, you're regretting getting high. 
You can fill in the blank. The things that we're spending money on. We need to be mindful and take inventory. And these are the things that I mentioned in a, um, an episode a while back. We need to be mindful of these things. Why are we spending money? Why are we spending time? Why are we spending our efforts on things that do not satisfy? On things that bring temporary relief? On things that we know that we're going to regret? And that was something I, I didn't even think that I was going to go, go down this road right now. But that was the thing, honestly, what led me to, honestly, to the road of abstinence. I mean, outside of like making that decision, you know, um, just, you know, a while back just with my testimony and you can watch different videos on that. But when it came to abstinence, I was tired of going out here with, with different guys and I knew on the other side, it's like, why, why would I participate in this knowing that it's going to be temporarily satisfying only, only to leave afterwards? I'm feeling the guilt. I'm met with shame. I'm met with, with like tears in my eyes because I know I'm grieving God. Like I would be crying. <laughs> I would be crying like afterward because I'm just like, why am I doing this? I'm like, I know this man's about to leave me. This man's about to walk out of my bed and nothing is going like, like nothing is going to come out of this. So why am I putting myself in this harmful cycle? Why am I, why am I actively willing to, to bring some um, self-inflicted pain? That's what it is. I'm, I'm, I'm entering into this painful cycle willingly to get hurt in the end. And I'm like, that's, that's not the smartest thing. That's not the smartest thing. And I'm, I'm expecting a different result. What's, what's that phrase where it's like um, when you do the same thing repeatedly, expecting a different result is insanity, something along those lines. I would enter into these, these situationships, do the same things, being temporary, temporarily satisfied just to still go like fall on the other side of that and to be met with the shame, met with the pain, like met with like emotional distraught, like all of these things and expecting for them, like expecting a different result. I had to stop. I had to just stop and be like, you know what? This is it. This is the last time. This is the last time. I, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep falling into this cycle. Like, yes, yes. You know, the, the sexual immorality feels good. The pleasure feels good. The sex may feel good. But at what cost? At what cost? Yeah, it may be great, but at what cost? When you know on the other side of that, you're going to be crying. You're going to be hurt. You know they're going to leave you. <laughs> you know they're going to be like, oh, well, this is fun. Deuces. And everything that you created with them just vanishes. It's, it's one of those things where it's just like, what? What are we doing? What are we doing? But anyway, so I, I read Isaiah 55, and these were some of the things that came to me um, with some of the notes under it. If we know the need for water for our flesh, imagine how dehydrated we are in the spirit. If we know that Jesus is the living water, yet we know that we can't go without water for what, three to five days? You can't go without water. Yet how long are people going without the word? How long are people going without spending time with Jesus? We are spiritually dehydrated. That's why he said, come to, come to me, those who are thirsty. Because we thirsty. <laughs> but people are, people are satisfying their thirst with some soda pop, with some juice, with whatever counterfeits are out there, providing temporary relief. Because what the sugars, the salts, everything that, that we drink, they leave you wanting more. They leave you still temporarily un, like satisfied. You're only, it's temporary. But water is the thing that truly satisfies the thirst. Water is the thing that we need to be running to. Who we should be running to. The next thing is we need to be mindful of what can satisfy our thirst because this opens up the door for deception. There was, um, I didn't think I was going to go this far. I just thought about something. 
there was something there was a one of my one of my patients right there was um I was talking with them and well my patient's parents and they were like yeah I give them water yeah I give them water but they had a lot of cavities so I'm like if they don't like sweets and they eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and you're telling me they drink a lot of water and they don't even like candy why why are these cavities popping up and they're like yeah I give them a whole lot of water. I even water before bed, water in the morning, water with everything. Like I, I brush their teeth twice a day. I don't know what's going on with, with this. And I was like, okay, something ain't adding up. So I was like, okay, um, is there, I'm like, what kind of, I'm like, is the, is the water like a bottled water? And they're like, yeah, it's a bottled water. I'm like, well, what's the name of this water? I'm not going to say the name of it. I honestly, I, I don't even remember. Turns out. Turns out this water, whatever this water brand is, and I'm not going to say it again because I'm, I'm not going to do all that. But there's this water brand. It's clear like water. It looks like water. It's in the water section, but it's juice. Mm. It's juice because it's a flavored water, flavored water, but it's full of sugars. When the parent told me the name of the water, I'm like, I haven't heard of this water brand before because it was juice. But the parent was even deceived. The parent didn't even know. The parent was like, oh, this water bottle, it looks like water. It's clear like water. It's in that blue, like kind of like water kind of like bottle. But it's, it's full of sugar. It was full of sugar. Because that's why I was like, I was, I was curious. I was like, what? I was like, if they're doing all these things that seem right, how is, how is it that they're, they're still getting these cavities? So if they're giving this, this fake water, this juice, before bed, in the morning, all throughout the day, that's the reason why these cavities were happening. But the thing is, is that they were open to deception because on the outside, on the outside, it looked like it was water. It looked like it was good for you. It looked like it was healthy. Instead, it has all these sugars inside. Instead, it has all these things that are a detriment to our health. Things that don't truly satisfy. And I didn't know I was going to go down that road today. But that, that was just the first thing that just popped up even after reading this. But it, when we have to be mindful of what can satisfy our thirst. Because that can open up the door to deception. We can say, yeah, it looks like a duck. It quacked like a duck, but is it really? <laughs> is it really? And that might be a Southern saying, I, you know, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it may look the part. It may even sound like it's tickling the ear. But at the end of the day, we need to use our wisdom and our discernment and our good judgment to determine if this is the thing that, if this is the water that we need to be drinking from, quote unquote water. Or is it really just juice? <laughs> Is it a watered down kind of version of the things that we shouldn't be having? Are we opening up the door to compromise? Oh, it's not really that bad. That's opening up the door to compromise. You're opening up the door for deception. So we just need to be mindful of those things. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention, the first person Jesus revealed his identity to was someone who was thirsty. John 4, the woman at the well. I'm not going to go deep into that story because I, I, I mean, that story is beautiful, but I'm not going to go into that story right now. Um, but I thought that, that was that was interesting, right? The first person that Jesus revealed his identity to, I can give you some living water. I can give you a water that'll quench your, your thirst. Someone who was thirsty. She was not only physically thirsty, Right. Because she she was the one she was going to the well. Right. But she had a thirst that she thought, you know, different things could satisfy, but it didn't. And I'm not going to put the focus on the woman at the well, but it's just the fact that and try and like, you know, shame her in any type of sense. Not at all, because there's a lot that we can learn from that story. If anything, I wish we knew her name. But it's the fact that Jesus revealed himself to someone who was thirsty in the same way that she was thirsty, we are thirsty too. <laughs> We're thirsty for different things. And Jesus is waiting to reveal himself to us. 
Jesus is waiting to say, I can give you a, wa a water that will not run out, a water that will quench your thirst, a water that will deeply satisfy your longing needs. So that was what I wanted to uh, read for the invitation to the thirsty, <laughs> just to set the stage. Um, but going into unbelief, stagnation and disappointment. Right. So with these things, um, at first I was going to go in. I'm not going to lie. I was going to go in a completely different direction. That's kind of like how a lot of these things go. Right. Um, I was going to go in the direction of like there are different people in the Bible um, that highlighted some of these different aspects. Uh, but instead when I was in my daily reading, this was what, a couple days ago. And God was like, yeah, we're going to scratch all that. Instead of having people, instead, we're going to go to a parable, um, that I'm sure is very familiar to y'all. This is in Mark four. This is one of my favorites. Um, it's the parable of the sower, the parable of the sower. So when it comes to unbelief, disappointment, and stagnation, um, for those that may not be uh, familiar with this passage, I do invite you to go ahead and read that. I'll go ahead and just give a brief overview of it. When it comes to Mark four and the parable of the soils, there are four different soils. It said that there is a, um, a gardener, right? That, uh, or sower, a sower that sows seeds. And there was a sower that sown seed among the path, a sower that sown seed among the thorns, a sower that sown seed, um, among rocky soil. And so, uh, a sower that sowed seeds among good soil. So we're going to break those um, those soils down. Uh, and I'm going to re read those explanations as well. But that's just an overview of the parable. And uh, yeah, we're going to go ahead and dive into that. So starting with unbelief. Starting with unbelief. And the thing about unbelief is that when you're not satisfied with his commands, this breeds disobedience. So again, remember when I said that these three things are rooted in dissatisfaction, right? So when you have unbelief, that unbelief is because you're not satisfied with what he commands us to do. And because of that, now you're being disobedient, right? God told you to do something. Yeah, no. That no is being disobedient. That no, you say, telling God no, that you're not going to do something. That's honestly because you don't remember who he is. So because we are not satisfied with what he commands us to do, we're not satisfied with the things that he has told us and instructed us to do in his word. Now we're being disobedient. Now we want to cherry pick. Now we want now when he says, oh, uh, no sexual immorality, no drunkenness. You're like, mm. that brings about disobedience. And with those with that disobedience comes consequences. It does, because it's not one of those things where we just get let off the hook. It's not one of those things where, where we just got by on that one. There are some moments when God does give us grace. There are some moments when God covers us with mercy. But the moment that we keep pushing and pushing and pushing on that door of, of, of disobedience, we're starting to walk out of his hedge of protection around us. Because we're willingly opening up the door and being in agreement with the enemy. That's what happens when we're disobedient. So there's a consequence to our sins. So I wanted to bring that up with the unbelief at first. Now with unbelief, um, I'm going to go ahead and read that portion in the scripture. Uh, so this is Mark 4 verse 4. And as he was sowing, some seed fell by the road and the birds came and ate it up. And then now I'm going to go to the explanation. And this is in Mark 4, verse 15. These in the first group are the ones along the road where the word is sown. But when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. And now I want to paint this picture because I'm sure some of y'all are like, well, Taylor, um, unbelief. I'm not. I, I believe in God. We ain't got to worry about me. I believe I have faith, you know, the word's not being, you know, uh, Satan's not snatching up this word for me. Listen to this. Dissatisfaction sounds like God, I love you until 
you tell me to change my desires. So it's like, okay, what does that look like? You might be having questions that say, where, where do you find your satisfaction? Where do you quench your thirst? Where do, you, where do you have desires that are outside of the will of God? Are you entertaining counterfeits? That's what it looks like. And that's what it sounds like. These are some of the, and this is not to condemn you again, because this is, this is a place where I didn't realize I was in all three of these things at one time. You can be all three of these at one time. And I was like, okay, look, at first I thought it was stages, right? Different stages, different seasons, different times, right? Oh, moments of unbelief, moments of doubt, moments of stagnation, moments of disappointment. But you can be all three of these at one time. And when I asked God to explain that to me, he was saying the way that you can be a lot of these different types of emotions and phases at once is with the different areas of your life. So there may be one area of my life I'm feeling stagnant, one area of my life I'm disappointed, one area of my life I'm having a lot of doubts. So it may not be the same just all across the door, like uh, uh, across the board, where you're just like in one overall, oh, this is the one season I'm in. It could be. But this is how these can be different aspects of your life. This could look like maybe you, you may have unbelief when it comes to your job. Or let me say, instead of unbelief, let me say doubts. You may have doubts when it comes to your job, doubts when it comes to your family, doubts when it comes to your future, doubts when it comes to your dreams. Or you may be disappointed when it comes to uh, where you are as far as where you live. You may be disappointed in not being able to achieve something that you wanted to achieve. You may be stagnant in an area where it's like, this is so routine. I want something new. You may be stagnant in your finances. You may be stagnant in your prayer life with God. So this is why with these different aspects, you can be all three of these things at one time. So I wanted to, I wanted to at least just put that out there um, because that's, that was something where I'm like, how can you experience all of these at once? And that's what God was honestly bringing me through. Now, um, something that, I heard at the conference that was was real big for me was doubting God is not a reflection of your faith in him. And that also brings you to the death. I was like, well, what's the definitions of these? Right. So doubt is a questioning of faith that can arise when someone doesn't understand why God is doing something. That's a question in your faith. Right. Not questioning your faith, a question in your faith. And unbelief is a deliberate decision to reject the truth, even in the face of evidence. So there's a difference between unbelief and doubt. As, as we're on this walk of faith, doubt is, doubt is bound to occur, right? Doubt is bound to occur. But you want to be careful so that that doubt does then not become unbelief. Where you're rejecting the truth. Where you're rejecting God's character. When you're rejecting the things that you know that God can do. Because it says you're rejecting the truth even in the face of evidence. And that's honestly where even the Israel, I feel like I really do bring the Israelites every single episode. I really bring them up. They were rejecting the truth of God being a provider, of God being a way maker, of God being a deliverer, of God being a provider. They were literally rejecting a protector. They were rejecting the truth about God, even when they had countless, countless spans of evidence to not reject him, and yet they were rejecting him. Don't let those doubts, don't let those questions fester and then let them turn to unbelief. Instead, meet those doubts with the truth of God. Instead, meet those doubts with his word, right? So um, this is something that I put in here as a... Um, challenge, right? The challenge is to cleanse your palate. Cleanse your palate. And with cleansing your palate, I don't just mean it with, with food, but this is where we got to check our appetite. When you cleanse your palate, um, you've cleansed that through manna, right? And through manna is his word. And the reason why this was brought up, and I think I was listening to this in another podcast, but they were saying the reason why God chose manna 
is because when they were living in the land of the Egyptians, they were eating things with onions, with, you know, with the leeks, with the... Um, with um, what is it? The the meats and the wines, things like that, right? Things that were very savory. But then when they had manna, that was something that was a little bit more neutral to prepare their palate to go into that land of milk and honey, which is more sweet. Because imagine, I mean, yes, you can have things that are savory and then eat something sweet like a dessert at the end, but you want something to cleanse your palate in between. You want something where you can have a, a, a nice smooth transition into the season that God wants you to go into. So if you know that you had some things of the past that you know that you need to cleanse yourself of, this is where you want to invite God into your day because that's what he wants from you. So what, and you want to, there, for some people, going cold turkey is the way to go. Going on a fast is the way to go <laughs> for some people, right? I know that was what worked for me. I had to, I had to just cut it off, go cold turkey, things like that. But for some people, they need more of a transition. For some people, they need more of a cleansing of their palate over time. And something that you can do uh, to walk with God throughout the day. What if instead during workouts, instead of listening to secular music, you're listening to gospel rap or Christian rap? What if while you're commuting to work, instead of listening to whatever secular podcast and, or whatever type of secular music or anything like that, I just keep going back to that or whatever shows about the world, things like that, even news, why don't, why don't you spend that time in silence expecting to hear from God when you're, when you're on your commute? Or what about when you're reading your books? Are the books something that, that glorify God? If maybe you can say, okay, I'm going to read. If, if you like to read, if I'm going to dedicate this hour, how about 30 minutes of reading the word? And then after that, 30 minutes of reading what other, other, what other type of genre you like to read? There are ways that we can incorporate God into our day, even though he wants to be incorporated all throughout the day. But he's OK with the baby steps. He doesn't despise small beginnings. He appreciates them as long as we don't stay there. So that's something uh, as a challenge to cleanse your palate. It's something to leave um, leave off of is your view of God's intentions will determine how much you follow his instructions. How, how you view God's intent for your life, that will determine whether or not we follow his instructions. Because that's where the unbelief or the doubting is rooted in because we're not satisfied with his commands for our life. And when we're not satisfied with those commands, then the enemy will quickly snatch those, that seed, right, of us trying to um, be nourished by the word. But we'll automatically be turned off of it with the moment where you're like, oh, we need to stop fornicating. Ah, I don't want to hear that. The enemy is already having you, is already snatching that word from you. Oh, you telling me I can't get drunk. Ah, I don't want to hear that. You telling me that I need to think on things that are pure. Ah, I don't want to hear that. That's what it sounds like. And that doubt then becomes unbelief in that area of your life. So that's the thing that we need to be mindful of. Um, the next thing is disappointment. Disappointment is like, uh, the seeds that are sown among the thorns. Now I'm going to go ahead and read that. This is in Mark uh, 4 verse 7. Other seed fell among the thorns and the thorns came up and choked it and it yielded no grain. Um, and then this is also the explanation of it. This is in... Uh, Mark 4, 18, and others are the ones on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the one who have heard the word, but the worries and the cares of the world, the distractions of this age with its worldly pleasures and the deceitfulness and the false security or glamour of wealth or fame and the passionate desires for all the other things creep in and choke out the word and it becomes unfruitful. And I, I really like the amplified version um, in this because it, it labels everything that we're, that we're worried about or anxious about right now. It literally lays everything out. It says right here, the distractions of this world, of the worldly pleasures, the false sense of security of wealth, the glamour, of fame, the deceitfulness, 
of trying to take root in these passionate desires. That's where a lot of us fall. And that's why a lot of us do get disappointed. Hence this book, <laughs> When Faith Disappoints. We can stay on this point for a long time. <laughs> but that's where it is. And something that um, with these next two, with uh, the seeds among the thorn and the seeds in the rocky soil, um, they're kind of, there's some things that compare and contrast with them. But this, the type of faith that God uh, put on my heart for this, with the seed among the thorns, convenient faith. You have faith when it's convenient. What that looks like is um, uh, when you, it's good to, it's, you know, you, you want to pray when you want things to go your way. You want to pray when you're like, oh, I need God to come through right now. You want to have faith when it's convenient. But don't ask you to be bold. Don't ask you to be confident about something. Don't ask you to be uh, sharing the gospel to strangers or to your family or to your friends or to take a stand on, on what you know is right and what God wants to do for you in your life and what God convicted you of. But you don't want to be bold about that in front of the people when they're like, when they're doing these things that you don't, um, when you know that God won't approve of you doing it. Where is that boldness now? It becomes inconvenient. So that's where convenient faith is when you have a uh, seed amongst the thorns. Um, also those thorns, right? That is the external conflict because the soil itself is good. The soil is good. The heart is good. But it's crowded out. It can't grow in the necessary environment that it needs to grow in because it's crowded out by the external conflicts, everything that we see. And that's when we have a crowded perspective. And when we have a crowded perspective, it leads to a shifted focus that makes you unfruitful. If I'm too busy looking at what my neighbor's doing versus looking at what God wants me to do. Then I'm not keeping my eye on the Lord who that's where my hope comes from. That's where my strength comes from. That's where I stay encouraged. I'm now becoming unfruitful because my eyes are shifting um, to my neighbor. And now that can lead to jealousy. That can lead to covetedness. That can lead to lusting after those things. That can lead to a comparison. Now I'm becoming unfruitful because now me shifting that focus makes my heart not right. And now it's, it's hard for God to use me in the areas that he wants to because my, my perspective is crowded. So when you have disappointment, it means that you are not satisfied with his timing. And not being satisfied with his timing breeds selfishness and self-sufficiency. When this breeds self selfishness and self-sufficiency, this leads to corruption. Now... <laughs> It's like, well, how did we come there? How did we get there when it comes to being disappointed? When you're disappointed, especially because of his timing. That brings selfishness because it's like, well, I deserve this. Your dissatisfaction starts to sound like, God, I trust you until your timeline doesn't match up with mine. And it's selfishness that's inside of our heart because it's like, I don't want to surrender that. I don't want to surrender this thing that you're telling me to give up. I don't want to operate in your timing. I want to operate in my own timing. I want you to speed this up. I want this blessing to be on Amazon Prime. <laughs> in two to, three day, two to three business days. Don't tell me two to three years. I want this to be a microwave blessing. Don't tell me this needs to be cooked in a crock pot. And that's when we become disappointed. Because God's timing it, it can lead to even self-sufficiency. We can even look at Abraham's story with that. I'm going to do, you know what? God's taking too long. He needs some help. I'm going to do this in my own timing. I'm going to do this in my own strength. I'm going to do this in my own self-sufficiency. There was something that um, I was listening to this in a sermon and they were talking about Moses. With Moses, um, they said, God put that desire of justice in Moses' heart. But when Moses tried to, to bring justice to that, to the one um, uh, is, uh, Israelite, when Moses tried to bring justice in his own strength, he could only deliver 
one person. But when God, uh, not when God, when Moses um, put that trust and surrendered it to God and surrendered that strength to God, he was able to deliver so many, so much more. He was able to deliver what thousands. So it goes to show when we try to do things in our own self-sufficiency, this could also lead to corruption. And I I say corruption is like, oh, well, corrupt how? Like that can be a little bit too much. But corruption in a sense of now, now my purpose is distorted. Now my views of God are distorted. They're corrupted. I'm letting the enemy take take a, a, a priority in my ear saying, yeah, God, God's not doing it for you. He's doing it for your neighbor. Your prayers ain't working. You doing all this stuff ain't doing nothing. Did God really say, oh, you can't, you don't, don't trust God on that. That's the enemy trying to take priority in your mind. That leads to corruption because now it's like, hmm. I do have a distorted perception now of God because it's not happening in my timing. Oh, let me go ahead and do it in my own self-sufficiency. That's corruption of, of our own strength. Now we're putting a limit on God's power because we want to do it in our own timing. This is the corruption that in the deception that we can start to live in when we start to then uh, draw out of the, the, the basket of selfishness. I want to do it because I want it right now. The basket of self-sufficiency. I'm going to do it in my own strength because it, it's, it's better in my hands than it is in God's hands. Now you're, it's, you're corrupted. And God's like, can I even trust you with this blessing? Can I trust you with this gift? Can I trust you to lead other people? Now it's a corrupted and contaminated product. Because what's supposed to be relying on God where we're supposed to be relying on his strength, relying on his word, relying on his timing. Now what's something that was supposed to be done and what, what was supposed to be created in such a beautiful framework in which God intended is now corrupted. We can go back to Abraham. What God wanted to do through Isaac, the promise, which he still delivered upon 13 years later after he gave um, Abraham the word, in the middle of that, he had an Ishmael. That wasn't in the plans. That created more grief. That created more pain. That created more corruption in the home. Because now you have bickering going on. Now you have uh, an unsettling. That was never supposed to be there. All because they wanted to work in their own self-sufficiency instead of waiting on the promise, instead of getting their hearts right for God. But God was still able to make something of that. God was still able to have his promise come to pass. But at what cost? At what cost? So now we're going into disappointment. Um, that disfa- dissatisfaction, right? You may even try and ask these questions. Will you still pursue God if he didn't give you what you were asking for? That'll also tell you where your heart lies. Will you still pursue God if he didn't give you what you were asking for? That's why we open up the door to disappointment. Those are those expectations, right? Well, I expect this. I expect that. I deserve this. The moment that we have our mindset on that, that's how we create these false idols. That's how we create these idols in our heart that we don't want to identify. But we know the grip that these, these good, it, it's, it could be a good thing. Marriage, relationships, a good job, some money. These good things, doing ministry even. These good things can become an idol. The moment that we, the moment that we have a grip on it so tightly, where if God's like, yeah, I'm not going to bless you with, these, with this because you're not ready for it. Will we still pursue God? If he told us that, will you still have a burning love for him or is it just conditional? Ooh, is your passion for God conditional upon the promises you think that he's going to give to you? 
that's where that's where it really lies. That's how you can tell whether or not something is an idol in your life. Because if God said, yeah, I'm not going to give you that. That will determine, oh, I'm not going to chase after him as hard because he's not going to give him, He's not going to give me what I want. He's not going to give me the things that I've been praying for. He's not going to give me these things where I have this level of expectation in my life, these goals that will determine whether or not I pursue after God as hard and I chase after him as much. We need to be real about it. And another question is, what does it look like to not be satisfied and to not let it change your heart? What does it look like to not be satisfied and to not let it change your heart? I know there's a whole bunch of like double negatives in there. Basically, what that question is asking is, even though I'm not satisfied, will my heart change? Even though I'm not satisfied, will I still pursue God? Even though I'm not satisfied, will I still love the Lord? Will I still chase after him with a burning passion? Even though I'm not satisfied, will I still believe that God is a provider? Will I still believe that God is a healer? Will I still believe that God is good? Will I still believe that God is loving? What does it mean to not be satisfied and to still have the same heart that to pursue after God unconditionally? That right there is the secret of being content. That right there is what Paul was call, talking about in Corinth, uh, not Corinthians, in Philippians. Because everybody wants to quote, you know, oh, uh, I could do all things through Christ who, straight, who gives me strength. Yes. Can we read the verses before that, though? I know what it's like to hunger and be satisfied. I know what it's like to have plenty and to have none. From there, I know I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's not just a cute little thing you put in your bio. He's saying, I know what it's like to be on all sides of the spectrum and to still pursue God with all my heart. I know what it's like to have a lot and pursue God. I know what it's like to have nothing and pursue God. You know, when, you know when Paul was writing that verse, he was in a jail cell and he found the secret of being content. That, that's what it is. To know what it's like to not be satisfied and to not let that change your heart on how you perceive God. So, um, also, uh, what is it right here? Yes. Oh, I, I heard this in the conference and I thought that this was really profound. Um, it says every delay taught us something new about God that we wouldn't have learned if he had been working in our timeline. I loved that. I loved that because um, what they were saying with that is that even when we don't understand the mind of God, we can still appeal to his heart. I wouldn't know what it's like for God to be a healer if I didn't if I wasn't sick. I wouldn't know what it's like to God for God to be a provider if I didn't need money, <laughs> if I was broke. I wouldn't know God to be a, a protector if I wasn't in a car accident that could have taken me out. It's so many things where we, there was every aspect of our lives in our own testimony, in our stories. We can look back and be like, man, that, that part of my life sucked. But there was an aspect that you, that you found out and you learned about God that you wouldn't have learned if everything just went smooth sailing in your life. I wouldn't know what it's like for, you know, to lean on God if I wasn't rejected from different dental schools. I know I mentioned that before. I know what I wouldn't know what it's like. I wouldn't know, like if everything was given to me in my own timing, if everything was given to me the way that I wanted. Mm, I can't even think like things would just not my life would just be turned all upside down. But anyway. I wouldn't know what these different attributes of God were like if I didn't go through those valleys, if I wasn't stuck in those pits. I know what it's like to be the lost sheep. It was something I was telling my friend where her and I were talking and I was like, those moments where I, I was dodging God, 
I was dodging. I would be like, okay, Lord, here I am on Sunday. Juke, let me go, let me go, let me run, let me run. Like, I was just like, like I was like juking him. Like, like oh, 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 here we go. Oh, I'm trying to do my way. I'm trying to go my way. Like, I'm trying to run out of your, I'm, I was trying to run to a place that didn't exist. I was trying to run to a place outside of God's hand. I was trying to run to a place outside of his hedge of protection on my life. Because I wanted to work in my own will. I wanted to work in my own desires, in my own self-sufficiency. I would be over here. I would run. I was literally the little lost sheep that was running away because I wanted to do things my way. But in all those aspects, God still had a hedge of protection over my life. God still had his hand on me. Honestly, just to save me for this moment right now, a part of my testimony I know what it's like when God left the 99 for me as the one and he did the same thing for you. He is chasing after you no matter how far you want to run. He's chasing after you. And um, oh, that was something, too. I don't want this season of waiting to be wasted. If there's if there's check boxes of things that God wants you to learn right now. Like, let's say there's 10 things God wants you to learn all 10 of them. Before you get to the next season, because the next season you have 20 things to do. If you're like, just give me to the next season, Lord, give me to the next season. Then now you're going to make that next season a whole lot harder if you don't check off the things that you need to learn in this season. Or he may not even transition you to that next season because he's like, I need you to get this right here. Or it would be way too difficult for you to handle in this next season. I don't want this season to go wasted. This see this this every like God doesn't waste time and God doesn't waste words. Neither should we. Why are we trying to waste the season that we're in? Instead, we need to take it all in. What is it that God's trying to show you in this season that he that, you know, needs to prepare you for the next? Because if we just try and sit on it and be like, no, God, just 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 put me in the next season, put me in the next season. He's like, you ain't, you can't handle that, baby girl. You can't handle that. <laughs> You're not ready for that. You ain't really ready for that. Because there have been some things, I'll be very honest, where, <laughs> where I was like, Lord, I know I'm ready. I know I'm ready for this next season of my life. And he would show me things. He's like, mm, you, it's still hard for you. It's still hard for you to let go of this. It's still hard for you to move on from that. It's like we're still here in, in this type of walk. You're not ready. And it took for him in his kindness to show me those things in my heart, which I didn't realize were there. But it took for him to reveal those things to me because I was just like, ah, I guess I wasn't. <laughs> I guess I'm not as ready as I thought I was. But it's, I'm thankful that he's shown those things to me. And I'm not letting this season go wasted. Like I'm, not, I'm not letting it go to waste. I'm not letting it go to waste. I'm taking in every single thing that God wants me to learn this season. Um, so the challenge for this, this section, right, of disappointment, surrender the fantasy. Surrender the fantasy. And this, this, that, that fantasy is your timeline and your thoughts. You have to surrender it. The picture that you thought of your life the fantasy that you thought that your life was going to be like at whatever certain age, whatever certain timeline, whatever certain like uh, point in your life, we have to surrender it. We have to surrender it. Because um, if we don't, that's what fuels the disappointment. When we un, unsurrendered, I don't even know if this is the word, unsurrendered timelines, unsurrendered thoughts, an unsurrendered fantasy. That creates that creates a false expectation, which fuels your disappointment. And we wonder why we're getting disappointed so frequently, because we're putting we're putting an expectation on God that God never co-signed. We're putting we're putting a, an expectation on God. Where he's like, I didn't even have that in the plans for you. And that's what we need to look at. Um, also recognizing that. When it comes to your timeline, start with your timeline, <laughs> i.e. social media. And I know I've talked about this before where it's like, 
I realized that what I, it was hard for me to surrender the fantasy in my mind because it kept getting built up when I was on social media. I realized it was hard for me to surrender my thoughts and the fantasies of my, of my future because of, me, of, of my mindless, endless scrolling on social media, comparing my life to everyone else's. And I know I talked about that in another podcast, so I won't go too deep, but that's where it starts with. Sur surrender your thoughts, surrender your fantasy, surrender your timeline. Be mindful of, of how long you're on social media and practice gratitude. Lord, thank you for this home I'm in. Thank you for allowing me to have clothes on my back. Thank you for allowing me to have food on the table. That was something where I didn't think I was going to go into this, but it was something that I just remember from the conference. God meeting your needs does not mean that he's going to provide for you in abundance. I don't know who needs to hear that. When God says he's going to meet your needs, it may not mean that he's going to provide for you in abundance. And that was so profound to me because I was like, whenever I'm like, okay, Lord, I need money. Lord, I need money. Lord, my bank account is looking real skimpy. Okay. He, I, he would give me enough every single day, every single month to pay my bills, to pay my rent, to be able to have groceries. And he would give me just enough. And the tithe. I would still have just enough to survive from paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. I literally have just enough because be before I was looking at it like, Lord, I need more. Like, like have somebody drop a million dollars off of my doorstep. Like have some have something to where I I get a whole bunch of money to where I'm in abundance. But instead, God's like, no, I'm meeting your needs. I'm meeting the exact need that you need. That you require. And that, so that's why when them saying that in the conference was so profound to me, because it said God meeting your, your needs does not look like abundance, may not look like abundance. And he's been providing every single one of those needs. So uh, that's the disappointment. The last one is stagnation. Stagnation is when you're feeling stagnant, right? You're feeling still. You feel like you're in the routine of life. This is the seed that fell among the rocky soil. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and read that. This is Mark 4. Uh, verse five, other seed fell on rocks where there was not much soil and immediately a plant sprang up because the soil had no depth. And this is the explanation of it. Um, let's see. This is in verse 16. In a similar way, these in the second group are the ones on whom the seed was sown on rocky ground, whom when they hear the word immediately receive it with joy but accept it only superficially and they have no real root in themselves. So they only endure for a little while. Then when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, immediately they are offended and displeased at being associated with me and they stumble and fall away. And with the seed on rocky soil, the type of faith that God put on my heart is that it's adrenal faith. Adrenal faith. So in disappointment, it's convenient faith. Stagnation, adrenal. Adrenal basically means it runs on adrenaline, spurts of adrenaline. You go to a conference, ooh, I'm stirred up. You go to a church service, ooh, I'm stirred up. But then on Monday morning, you act like it never happened. You go back to the same old things. You fall into the same old pattern. So adrenal faith, where it's like it excites you for a moment, but then after that, you're done. After that, you fall back into the same patterns of life, the same cycle of life. So with that adrenal faith, um, especially with the rocky soil, you're facing internal conflicts in your heart. You're facing things on the inside because you're lacking a depth in your relationship with God. And this may be like, oh, but Taylor, like me and God go deep. Like I go into these deep prayers, but I still feel kind of like stagnant because there's there's a depth. We can't ever achieve a true deep, how can I phrase this? Like there is a depth that we can go in God for sure. But because God is so big, God is so vast. We will never achieve a depth on this side of glory 
where we can be like, okay, I'm done. Me and God got to level 10. I don't need to grow no more. God is so big where we are always expected to grow. We're always expected to transcend from glory to glory. We're always meant to go inside of our uh, own sanctification, uh, not own sanctification, but to pursue sanctification for the rest of our lives. We're always meant to grow. There, there is always an aspect of God that we will never know about. So we should never get so stagnant in our relationship with God. I don't care how many times you read the Bible through. There is still something about God that we still don't know about. That there's still a depth that we still need to reach. And that's why I brought up the stagnation um, uh, portion. Um, so when you're not satisfied in your relationship with God, that breeds a lack of pursuit and interest. And when you're no longer pursuing after God, when you no longer feel interested, when at first maybe like you were like, okay, I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to pray at night. I'm going to do all the things. I'm going to go to Bible study. You get to a point where you're like, I don't even feel like I want to go. I don't even feel like I want to read. Like, I don't, I don't want to wake up early to pray right now. I'm just going to hit this news button and go to sleep. I don't really feel like praying at night. I'm just going to jump in the bed, go to sleep. I had a long day. When you're no longer actively pursuing after God, like, yes, things change in our lives. Like circumstances may change, right? You may have a new work schedule. You may start to have children. You know, you, things may change, right? But I'm talking about when, when things are still the same and you're not pursuing after God like you used to. Your interest in God is starting to dwindle and he's starting to get things on the back burner of life, right? When you start to uh, breed a lack of pursuit and interest, that leads to compromise. It was like, well, Taylor, how is it that I'm stagnant? I'm not satisfied in my relationship with God. I'm not pursuing him like I used to. How can that bring about compromise? It's because you start to compromise your priorities. You start to compromise in areas where it's like, this used to be given to God, but now I'm gonna give it to something else. I used to be able to wake up early and pray, but now I'm just gonna hit this news button. I used to spend the last hour of my night to wind down and worship for God. Instead, I'm going to go ahead and binge watch TV. I used to take out times in the middle of my day for lunch to pray and be in silence with God. Instead, I'm going to hang with friends and just gossip about the day. I used to be able to uh, listen to, to Christian music and Christian hip hop, R&B, rap, you know, Christian, whatever, but now some of my friends over here are talking about the latest secular albums. Instead, I'm going to let me go ahead and listen to see what they're doing on that side. You no longer find satisfaction. You no longer pursue after God. And from there, that's what opens up the door to compromise. And I know I have talked about compromise plenty of times on this channel <laughs> because it's so easy. It's so easy. It's so easy to fall into that, that, that compromise trap. So easy. So easy. Um, so what does dissatisfaction sound like? God, I'll grow with you until I'm uncomfortable. I'll grow with you until I'm bored. I'll grow with you until you ask me to level up in my relationship with you. Because then you ask for too much, God. You ask for too much. You ask me for way too much. You want me to wake up at what time? You want me to pray for how long? You want me to fast for how many days? You want me to do what? That's what that sounds like. You want me to read my word for how long? You want me to set what kind of goals in our relationship? That's what that looks like. God, I'll grow with you until. And some of the questions that we need to ask ourselves do you believe that God is worth it? And then here's the other, this question right here. This may sting. Do you believe that God owes you something? God, I put in this work with you. God, I, I read my word. I prayed day and night. And I ain't get much from this relationship. I feel like I'm the only one working. I feel like I'm the only one putting in. You feel like God owes you something. 
Instead, those things should have been done out of a labor of love. Not something that's transactional. Relationships shouldn't be like that. I can even, I'm not even going to talk about just like romantic relationship. How about a friendship? I'm not over here, you know, um, calling up my friends and saying, hey, because uh, I'm looking out for you, you need to look out for me. That's that loyalty. Because I, I pay for your lunch, you need to pay for my lunch. I bought, I, I bought you a gift, you need to buy me. That's transactional. That's transactional. I don't even look at my friends that way. Sometimes out of the, you know, out of the goodness of my heart or out of the goodness of their heart, they'll be like, hey, Taylor, I want to give you some flowers because I think you really need these right now. Or they'll be like, hey, Taylor, I want to treat you out to lunch. Or there'll be times where I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to treat you to lunch. But it's not because it's transactional. It's out of our love for them. That's how it should be. So we're not reading our word. We're not worshiping. We're not, we're not praying out of a transactional relationship with God. We're doing it out of our love for him. Our desire to grow in deep intimacy with him. So um, also something that I put when I was thinking about this last part of uh, stagnation. What do you do when the honeymoon stage is gone? When the butterflies have left? When things feel like it's routine? When things feel like it's at a standstill? What do you do? And he said, you grow, you increase your intimacy. You increase that intimacy. And I'm like, okay, well, Lord, what does that look like to increase an intimacy with you? The thing is, is when it comes to increasing intimacy, the challenge is that you have to decide that he's worth it. You have to decide that he's worth it. You have to admit that the spark is gone. And then you have to ask him, what areas do I need to recommit to you? Because I'll be honest, y'all, this is exactly what happened with me. <laughs> this is exactly what happened with me. Literally what? The, uh, two weekends ago. Two weekends ago when God was putting this, this, uh, these three words on my heart. He was like, Taylor, your prayer life is lacking. You becoming, you're becoming lazy with your fasting. You're starting to, to, to get little chunks of the word versus reading those passages like you used to. He was, he, he's like, you're becoming lazy. You're becoming lazy. You're becoming satisfied with the small things. I want you to, where's that fire? I need you to grow. So with that, I had to, I had to decide, Lord, okay, yes, you are worth it. You're worth it. You're worth it over whatever amount of sleep I need to get. That means I need to plan my day better and go to, go to bed earlier instead of hitting the snooze button. Lord, yes, you're worth it. I'm going to read even more. And I, this is not saying that, that you're, you know, um, it's all caught up in the works. But the thing is, is that if I was doing something before, Nothing again has really changed in my life. But I decided to dial it back because I chose that. Not because that's something that me and God agreed on. But it was because I wanted to. So because of that, but in a relationship, we need to work together on these things. So if for one season, God is saying, hey, I need you to read a chapter a day. In another season, he may say, hey, I need you to meditate on this verse for one week. That's something that's been agreed upon for both of y'all. But for me, I was, I was dialing it back because I wanted to, not because I sought God's counsel to do that. I was like, yeah, Lord, I'm going to pray for 10 minutes here and I'm going to read this one chapter and we're going to be good for the day. He's like, I ain't choose that. That was the reason why, that was the reason why, uh, transparent moment again, it was last Wednesday when God, when I was, I was fasting and God was like, is this the fast that I have chosen? Oop! he reminded me quickly of uh, Isaiah 58. He said, is this the fast that I have chosen? Are you, are you fast? Are you fasting for me? He was like, he asked me the question, what are you fasting for right now? Who are you fasting for right now? Are you fasting for yourself? Are you fasting because this is just a routine? It's one of those things that he was, he was reminding me of with my fasting and how I was getting lazy with my prayers. Because it's one of those things where Imagine you and your a person, a friend, y'all like to play, I'm just going to say chess. Y'all like to play chess. That's, that's just y'all's thing. Y'all love to play chess every Saturday morning. Y'all love to play chess. 
But then, what if you get to a point where your friend is like, ah, you won. Ah, you know, like, that you won, you won the game. Or, and they're just not, they're, they're no longer having an intentional strategy behind their moves. They're just, they're just playing just to get the game over with. They're playing just to get the game, like, their heart is no longer in it. Then you're like, you know what? I don't even want to play this game no more because you don't, you're taking the fun out of it. That was literally what God was showing me when it came to my prayer, when it came to my fasting. I was starting to lose stamina. Because he's like, yeah, the fasting used to be on fire. You know, you used to do all these things. But now you're just pushing the plate back. But you're not, you're not increasing the prayer. You're not increasing the, increasing the devotion. You're just pushing the plate back like you think it's doing something for me. You voluntarily going hungry. <laughs> but instead, instead, I need you to find that gain, that, that, that passion again. Because you pushing the plate back and you fasting ain't doing nothing for me. Instead, it should be doing something for you and your spirit and growing. So that was something that's a transparent moment that's literally been happening <laughs> um, that God's been showing me. So, but that's the thing. So we have to decide that he's worth it. I had to admit, okay, Lord, the spark is gone. That spark, that intimacy, like it's dwindling. That fire that I once had, like that stamina, it's growing weak. I'm growing tired, Lord. Like what? Like I'm starting to like lose energy here. And from there, that's when I had to ask, what area of my life do I need to recommit to you? What area needs to be recommitted? And that was when he said, you know what? Focus on prayer. Let's focus on prayer. Focus on, on ramping that up. And the way that he was showing me is that when it comes to prayer, there was, I'm, I'm in a good groove right now of maintaining, right? Uh, like a maintaining a, a good, well-rounded lifestyle right now. So almost like with uh, working out. You know how you have the workouts where you're good to, to be healthy. You're, you have the workouts that are good to like maintain muscle tone and things like that. But you know when you're training for a marathon, people that, that start to train for the Olympics, training for whatever bodybuilding event, that training is different. So it's good when you're maintaining, right, out of season. But when you have to start training while you're in season, that was what he was calling me to. He was like, Taylor, you were doing a good maintenance program right? With the praying, with the fasting, with reading the word, you were doing those things. Cool. But now I need to shift you to a season of training, to a season of preparation, to a season to amp things up for what you're about to go to for the next, for the next uh, level that I'm trying to transition you to. We're, we're about to train now. I need you to do more. I need you to do more. But with what that, with what that looks like, that's when you need to go and seek him because he, it may not be prayer for you. Instead, it may be fasting that he wants um, that you need to recommit to him. It may be reading your word that you that, that's the area that you need to recommit to him. And the areas that, you know, um, that can help you find that that uh, uh, place in that area in which you need to recommit. It may be found in devotion, that personal devotional time with him. It may be found in the disciplines. It may be found in serving. It may be found in um, doing some personal studying of the word in that silent time. It may be found in community. You may not always have to isolate yourself. I know I talk about community um, on this channel too, but like with my friend group, with my life group, I bounce these ideas off of them and I let them know the things that I'm struggling with. And I say, guys, like, look, like my fire, my faith is, is starting to like not... I don't want to say it's wavering, but it's to get into the point where that light is looking real dim. It looks real dim. And I need some more motivation. I need some more stamina to pick this back up. And that's the beauty of community because they can say, hey, you know, I did. I was in that season before. This is what God told me. And from there, I take their suggestions. I bring that before the father. And there is where I can be. I can. Uh, uh. Uh, find the, the road in which God wants me to walk to increase that intimacy with him again. And I'm going to leave you on this last note. Uh, this is something that they also said this in the conference that I was like, this blew me away. 
When there's distance in a relationship, there's more assumptions about their intent. So when we're distant in our relationship with God, we start to, we start to doubt if he's good. We start to doubt that he's a provider. We start to doubt that he's a good father. When, when, when there's distance in the relationship, you start to assume things about God's character. That's not true. You start to embrace the lies of the enemy. You start to believe what the enemy is saying about God versus what you know about God. So that's why when you have distance in your relationship with God, we have to be careful. When you feel stagnant in your relationship with God, it's like, okay, Lord, clearly the fire is dwindling. How can we pick this back up? How can I recommit an area to you to increase its intimacy again? And we have ebbs and flows in relationships. We have those seasons. We have those, those hills and valleys. So this is a very real and transparent and vulnerable episode because we have moments like that. We all have moments where we're stagnant. We all have moments where we're disappointed. We all have moments where we feel doubt. But as long as we take those feelings and give them to God and not sit in them. And this is the last part, literally right before I was about to record this episode. This is the revelation that God gave me. He said, I know it's hard to enjoy the show when you're behind the curtain. But remember, I know what it's like to be on the verge of giving up when the burden is too heavy. I know what it's like to present your questions to the father and not receive an answer. I know what it's like to suffer and make sacrifices when it costs you everything. The beauty of knowing me is that you have a God who can meet you in your dissatisfaction as you surrender your heart and embrace this journey in trusting me. I hope this episode has blessed you. I pray that you have an amazing week and I'll see you in the next episode.